Johnny Halliday and the French Tour. On the 12th of October 1966, and less than a month since Jimmy arrived in England, the group departed for France as support act for Johnny Halliday. Accompanying them, at Redding's suggestion, as road manager was his close friend, ex-car mechanic, Jerry Stickles. The Jimi Hendrix experience was set to debut, even though they had no original material ready. Johnny Halliday was a master manipulator of an audience, says Chaz Chandler. Hendrix and I used to sit at the back of a hall and say, look what he's doing, look at that. He used to do a long set, party at a club he would rent after a gig, and then sing for another two hours. And though Jimmy knew all of the routines, somehow watching a Frenchman put a little extra grace into the tricks and licks helped him refine his stage act. We benefited so much from it. Really, the Hendrix experience's entire act, the entire basis of the act, was established on the Johnny Halliday tour, no questions about it. Those first gigs were strange, though. We were on a tour bus. Halliday just turned up in his new Mustang or whatever. The rest of us were in this rickety old coach. There were two English guys in Halliday's band. Mick Jones, now with Foreigner and Tommy Brown, who was the drummer from Nero and the Gladiators. They had worked together for some years, but were the only other English guys, whereas the rest, including a huge horn section, were all French. Mitch had this to say about the tour. On the first day on the road I got to sit next to this trombone player, and my French is non-existent, and his English wasn't much better. Anyway, I went through my suitcase, found this little piece of illegal smoking substance, sat down next to the trombone player again and attempted to roll a joint, which I did very badly. The guy said, Oh, Mish, you like? And I said, Well, you know, take it or leave it. After that, every night in the wings I'd get this little nudge, Mish, come with us and I'd go and have a smoke with the Halliday band. The atmosphere really loosened up, and they really got to like Jimmy and the rest of us. I'd worked in France before, but only TV things, so I had very little experience of French audiences. They don't clap. You'd finish off a number and... Silence. You'd think, Christ, what's this? Is it respect or do they really hate us? On the first few gigs they didn't know how to take us. But it seems that we were going down quite well. We'd have been told pretty damn quickly if they really had hated us. This is what Noel had to say. Our first tour started with a late plane, speakers missing on arrival, and a mad rush to get to rehearsals, press admitted, at the wonderful Paris Olympia. We all, including Chaz, humped gear, counted pennies, fretted and prayed. We were so happy just to be playing and eating. The schedule was as follows. October 13th, Evro, 14, Nancy 15, an unknown venue near Luxembourg, 18 Paris Olympia. The musician's coach took us to Evreux, where we were supporting Johnny Halliday, who travelled separately in his Aston Martin. Before the gig, we sat quietly and had a couple of smokes hash and tobacco combined European style in big multi-skin joints to calm the nerves. Jimmy wasn't used to smoking in this way, and he always asked, roll me one of those big English joints, Noel. I can't do it. I don't think he ever sussed rolling those joints. We were uncertain about how we'd be received, because we knew our sound was hard to categorize, a real mishmash of influences, plus a few decibels thrown in for good measure. We needn't have worried. Our 15-minute four-song set got a good reception, in spite of the blown bass speaker which forced me to plug directly into the PA. Good vibes for the best of beginnings, and more hash than I'd ever seen. In Nancy we extended our pre-gig brain modifications. I introduced the band to the uppers Keptogen and Preludin I knew so well by now. Europe's huge chemical drug companies had the continent swimming in pills. I rationed everyone to a half tablet, knowing that a whole one would keep us up all night. After that, before gigs, it was, Hey Noel, got any of those tablets? And because I'd finished my course of clap pills and could drink again, it was up, down and sideways. Total earnings for the French tour were 3,375 francs. After our Luxembourg gig we had a day off to look forward to. We got drunk together after the show, and at half twelve we crawled into the coach, set off, and promptly ran out of petrol. Was it cold? This never would have happened in the summer. Mitch grabbed Chaz's raincoat for himself and went to sleep. Chaz, Jimmy and I huddled together and tried to keep from freezing through the long, long night. We were required to rehearse for the big Paris gig. This meant sitting around all day thinking too much, getting terrible nerves and feeling ill. At least when roaming around outside our amazement at being in Paris kept our minds off the impending show. As it turned out, our three numbers, Everybody Needs Somebody to Love Have Mercy, and Hey Joe went down a bomb. Talk about relief. 
We got merry at the theatre, then headed off to a big party in a posh downstairs club and got drunker and more stoned, with the uppers keeping us raving. Suddenly it was 6.30 in the morning. We just managed to pack up the gear in time to drag it to the airport, complaining constantly and dreaming of a roadie. But we laughed and joked. High on our success, total earnings for the tour were 3,375 francs. We could handle anything. Hey, Joe. Shortly after returning from France, the band booked into Kingsway Studios in London, primarily to cut their first single. It was already agreed that this would be a version of Hey Joe, a number that Hendrix regularly performed in New York, although Mitch is fairly sure that for some reason the band didn't work it out until their return from France. The story goes that Chaz knew the song as well as Jimmy and had decided that if ever he got to produce a band, he would get them to do Hey Joe, as he was sure it would be a hit. The story continues that as he walked into Café War, that fateful day, Jimmy was actually performing the song. To the best of my memory, we used the first version of Hey Joe. I have a feeling that a little later we went into Regent Sound and may possibly have attempted it again on that session, but I'm sure that we used the original at the Kingsway. Once Hendrix had thought up and shown Noel that walking bass part, at Kingsway we'd got it down really quickly, and the subsequent versions weren't as good. The Scotch of St. James the Showcase Gig and London Debut the 25th of October, 66, fueled by their triumphant success in France, the group returned to England to prepare for their London club debut at the Scotch of St. James. The showcase gig may as well have been closed to the public, with musicians and industry personnel packing the club to get a first-hand look at what would be London's newest sensation. The French gigs had gelled the trio much faster than anticipated. At the very least, Chandler knew that the three-man concept was working. With a strong performance at the Scotch on October 19th, the experience could work around London clubs as a legitimate attraction rather than merely a curiosity. The Scotch was a small place, remembers Jerry Stickles, but we were trying to impress big agents such as Dick Katz and Harold Davison. The club owner kept trying to get me to turn down Hendrix's amp. I kept saying that I would do so at the end of the next song, but as each song ended, I ran into the bathroom to hide. The experience were a smash success once again, London's rock cognoscenti, so fervent in their adulation of authentic American blues and R&B performers, accepted Jimmy immediately. As raw and frenzied as his Scotch performance was, Hendrix was clearly unique. Hendrix exuded the very passion and conviction that British audiences loved in America's best blues and R&B artists. Stone Free, the 2nd of November 66, Jeff Beck cites Stone Free as his favourite Hendrix song. It's just a really great Jimi Hendrix driving rhythm. And the solo, the way that it burns in. If somebody's talking to me and that comes on, I can't listen to them. Stone Free tackles Jimmy's pet subject, freedom of action from three points of view. The first is geographical claustrophobia, an obsession with constant movement. Every day in the week, I'm in a different city. The second is his distaste for those who try to force their opinions on other people or who mock anything or anybody out of the ordinary. They talk about me like a dog, talk about the clothes I wear, but they don't realize they're the ones who square. And the third rails against any woman who thinks she can tie him down emotionally. A woman here, a woman there, try to keep me in a plastic cage, but they don't realize it's so easy to break. What is interesting in the song is that although it was written before Jimmy was famous, as a traveling musician, he had already had to deal with two contrasting hassles of high life to be, Asinine comments about his appearance and the legion of women hanging round his legs whether he wanted them there or not. Jimmy was quite old-fashioned and very shy when it came to women. His New York friend Mike Quashy observed that if he saw somebody he liked in a club, for instance, he would go through a whole routine of asking somebody to ask the girl if she wouldn't mind joining him at his table, and he would be terribly polite and charming. Some of Jimmy's peers, like Led Zeppelin, says Mike laughing, adopted a somewhat more Neanderthal approach to courtship. 